the moment you've all been waiting for, you are dismissed to go to kids church now. Yay. Thanks for worshiping with us, kids. Awesome. You know, it is powerful when your children see you worship. It's powerful when they see you living for Jesus, right? That's a good thing. So make sure you do it in front of them. Worship with them. Pray with them. It's really an important thing that we do with our kids. How many of you guys realize that God is up to something good in your life? Do you know that? He is up to something good in your life. Touch your neighbor and say, God has plans for me. Yeah. Amen. He has plans for you. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your life that is a good plan. It's a fun plan. God has a plan. He, he planned around who you are. He designed life for you in mind. Not everybody's life is going to be the same. Not all of our lives are meant to be the same thing. You are not all called to come up here and preach on a Sunday morning. And many of you are saying, whew, praise God. Not everybody's called to work in nursing. Not everybody's called to be a teacher. Not everybody's called to do whatever it is that you are doing in your life. God has a plan designed for you. He designed it to fit your giftings, to fit your, your calling. And God wants to have you, he wants your career to be one that will satisfy your desires and be what God wants you to be. He has a destiny that he has planned for you and for you alone. It's uniquely designed for you. It's a wonderful, it's a God-glorifying, it's an abundant, joy-filled destiny that God has planned for you. We all know the verse, 20, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to what? Prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That's God's plan for you in a nutshell. And it's a good one. Ephesians chapter 1, I think. Boom, boom, boom. There it is. Did you do that or did I do it? <laughs> Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to to the purpose of his will. And then we have Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has a plan for your work. God has a plan for what your life is supposed to be. He has a plan and a destiny for you, and it's a good one. He's predestined our lives and prepared, uh, prepared work, he prepared a future, he prepared a home. Uh, he designed that future that would bring glory and joy to God, and it would bring glory and joy to your life as well. He wants you to be happy. Is that surprising? Some people think that if I surrender to Jesus, I'm going to be miserable. God for sure is going to make me a priest or something. I'm going to be celibate, and I'm going to have to live in Africa. Not if that's not God's design for your life. And if it is God's design for your life, that is the only thing in your life that's ever going to satisfy you. That's why God chose it for you. He knows what you need. He knows how to make you satisfied. Because God is all-knowing. We call him omniscient. He knows everything. God does not exist in one place in time, by the way. He exists in all time and all places at one time. That will blow your mind, keep you up all night. If you have a problem falling asleep because you fall asleep too much, just start thinking of that. That'll keep you up. You won't be able to sleep. God, when he looks at your life, he doesn't see you just right now. But he sees you in the future as well because he's already there. Right? So he sees you right now. He sees you past, present, and future. And he sees it all. You just see the mistakes you've made. You just see what's happening in your circumstances right now. But God sees what happens from, from years from now. He sees your entire destiny at, in one sitting. 
every day as if it were today. So before he created the earth, he saw you, and he knew you, and he planned things for you. He designed things for you. He knew your strengths, and he knew your weaknesses. He knew your gifts. He knew your talents. He knew the choices you would make. He knew the things that you would desire. He knew the things that would bring you fulfillment and joy in your life. When my kids were little, they were very concerned about heaven. They wanted to know, what is heaven going to be like? You know, they said, are there going to be video games in heaven? <clears throat> this was really an important question. Will there be video games in heaven? Because there's not, I don't know that I want to go there. Are there going to be video games in heaven? How about roller coasters? I'd have these kind of questions. Will there be roller coasters in heaven? You know what they were wanting to know is this. Is it going to be fulfilling? Am I going to be sitting on a white cloud playing a harp? Because I don't know about you, but that's not very fulfilling. That's not a very good destiny to sit on some white cloud, float around, and play my harp. That's horrible. That would be a terrible existence. Sitting around in my underwear on a harp. That, no, thank you. <laughs> but I need you to understand that God is not planning for you a life that is not fulfilling. It's designed to, to fit you uniquely. He knows all about you. It's designed for you. And it's not lame. It's the best possible outcome. It's the best possible future. It's the best possible scenario out there is God's plan and destiny for your life. So I want to start talking with you about this idea of God's destiny and stepping into your destiny that God has for you, for you personally. And I want to start today by looking at a man in the Bible named Jacob. Jacob was called by, not this Jacob, him too, he's called too. But this is a guy in the Bible, Jacob in the Bible. And this man was called by God. God put a calling on his life. God had a plan for his family, just like he has a plan for your family. And by the way, if you're not even married yet, God has a plan for your family. God has a plan for your spouse that you're going to marry one day. He knows who that is. Parents, you pray every day for that spouse. I don't care if your kids are two. We've prayed for our kids since they were babies and pray over them. Lord, I pray for that spouse, whoever this person is. Lord, keep them. Lord, save them. Lord, bring them, prepare them. I still pray that. And now my kids go, amen. Bring it on, Lord. Bring it on. Yes, Lord. I claim that. I claim that in Jesus' name. But Jacob is a man that... that he had a, God, God designed his family. And he had, a, he had a design on his life. Genesis chapter 35, we read about Jacob, and it says, God appeared to Jacob again. This is verse 9. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padam Aram and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob. But Israel shall be your name. <clears throat> Jacob means deceiver, deceitful one. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, <clears throat> I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. Kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you. And I will give the land to your offspring after you. So God, God has a plan for him. God has a plan for his future. He has a plan for his homeland. He has a plan for where he's going to live, where he's going to raise his kids. He has a plan for his family and the generations to come. Just like God has a plan for you. God has a plan for your children and your children's children and generations to come. And you're a part of that plan. How you raise him is going to affect that plan of God. There's a destiny out there. And for Jacob... This is quite a plan, right? Talk about being a shaker of nations. Talk about being a nation builder. Jacob, this is a divine, amazing plan that the Messiah is actually going to come through the line. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords that's coming through the lineage of Jacob. It's quite a, quite a feat, quite a, quite a destiny, isn't it? But 
Things do not go smoothly along the way. Things don't work out according to plan along the way. Because Jacob made some really stupid choices. They got him and his family into all kinds of trouble. The guy turns out, by the way, to be an idiot. Who knew? He marries two women. Those of us who married one woman know better. You marry one and that's enough. Marry two and that's just nothing but trouble. Marry them at the same time and you need a mental hospital. This is insanity. He marries two women. One he loves and the other one he doesn't even love her. But he married them both. And his wives are constantly fighting because now this dysfunction is there in the marriage and they're fighting with each other. Now, come on, you think you've got problems in your marriage. Try this one out for size. These two women are fighting and competing over him and wanting his affection, trying to win his affection, trying to win his approval. And neither of them feel very loved by him at all. One isn't even loved by him, but they're competing. And the heart of the blessing and destiny for Jacob was his children, right? Be fruitful and multiply. A nation is going to come for you. But because of this dysfunction in his marriage, this leaks over to dysfunction in his children. Come on. This is how it works. You allow dysfunction in your marriage, and it's going to leak over and make you dysfunctional with your children as well. And not only will you have a dysfunctional marriage, but you end up having dysfunctional children and a dysfunctional family. This is the story of Jacob and his family. The children who are born from the wife he doesn't love were intensely jealous because the wife he did love has one son, Joseph. And they're intensely jealous. They're carrying out what there was being played out in their parents' relationship. You cannot have a marriage and be disrespectful for one another and then you expect your children to be, dis- to be respectful to you. Listen, mothers, you wonder why your sons are so disrespectful to you and speak disrespectfully to you? How do you speak to their father? Dads, you wonder why your children are disrespectful. How are you speaking to their mother? What have you patterned? What have you shown them? What have you, what have you displayed for them and modeled for them? It's going to carry out in the whole family. And this is what's happening here. Total dysfunction. Total dysfunction. Even though that is the core, that is the center root of this promise and destiny of God was his children, was his family to be blessed and to prosper. And yet, it's full of dysfunction. And I want you to know that very often the, bound, the, 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 the place of your greatest conflict and your greatest tension is your destiny under attack. The place that you're getting the greatest conflict and the greatest tension is often your destiny under attack. That's the place that you need to go after. In your de- that's your destiny. You want to know why your marriage is under, it's under fire? Because that's your destiny. Because it's going to affect your children and your children's children for generations to come. And the enemy knows this. So Jacob, in spite of the plans and promises of God for his destiny, was dysfunctional father. He's raising dysfunctional children in a dysfunctional family. And because of that jealousy, the older sons, and if you know the story, it's in the book of Genesis, you can read the story of, of Jacob and his family and Joseph. The older sons eventually take Joseph, who is clearly Jacob's favorite, He's so dysfunctional that the rest of his children don't even feel loved by their dad. And he's pouring out all of his affection, all of his attention upon his one son, Jacob. He's got 10 other sons. He virtually ignores them, and he pours all of his affection and attention on his favorite son, Joseph. And the boys can see that. They get tired of it. And they're, because of the jealousy, they, they, they take that boy and they throw him down in a pit and they sell him as a slave to Egypt. And they go back and they tell his dad, I'm sorry, but your son died. 
They take his coat that Jacob had made him, and it's covered with animal. They, they covered it with animal blood and said it was his own blood, and a, a, an animal must have devoured him. So Jacob's heartbroken. He thinks his son's dead. His favorite is dead and gone. And Jacob wonders, where was that destiny now? And the, the family ends up in a land of drought and famine with no food. And Jacob wonders, where is that destiny now? And to get food, he sends his sons to Egypt, but they get arrested and they get thrown into prison. And Jacob wonders, where is that destiny now? They're released, but the oldest son is kept as a hostage in Egypt because it's actually Joseph in disguise. And Joseph says, I want my whole family here. I want you to go get my younger brother, Benjamin, that I haven't even met yet. Because in the meantime, there's a new, a new boy has been born named Benjamin. He says, you go back and get Benjamin, or I'm not, not going to let your older brother out. And Jacob wonders, where's God's destiny now? They go back, and they get home to Jacob, and they're unloading their stuff, and the money they took to pay for the food that they just bought, is, it somehow got back in their things. And they're terrified because now they realize we'll never get my son, we'll never get our brother out of there because they're going to think we ripped him off. And Jacob wonders, where is God's destiny now? And in frustration and in doubt, Jacob cries out against all of these circumstances in his life. And here's what he says in Genesis 42, verse 36. Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. All this has come against me. NIV says everything is against me. Many of us this morning, many of you this morning, look at your lives and, and, and you're, in, you're in some predicaments. And maybe you have children who have not turned out to be like you thought they would. Maybe you have a marriage that isn't as glorious as you thought it would be. Maybe your financial situation is not as healthy as you want it to be. Maybe your health or your emotional or your mental state are not what you thought they would be. They're not where, you're not where you want to be. And you thought your life would take a certain road, but it turned sharply. And it's not what you thought it was going to be. And now you're sitting here wondering, where is that destiny now? Everything is against me and nothing is for me. Everything's going wrong. You're going through disappointment. You're going through tragedies. You go through heartache. And you wonder, like Jacob, where is that destiny now? And I need you to know something. God has a perfect destiny for you, but you're not perfect. And you do not live in a perfect world. And there's a lot of things that happen between here and the destiny of God that aren't so nice, that didn't turn out the way you thought they were going to turn out. There's some heartache, there's some disappointment, there's some heartbreak and a lot of confusion. And you say, what's going on? What's going on? I thought God had a destiny for me. I'm hearing you say this. See, we know as Christians how to hear with our ear, but we don't listen with our heart because our heart says, hey, I know you're saying God has a plan to prosper me, not to harm me, a plan to give me hope in the future, but I'm not seeing it. I'm seeing the abuse in my life. I'm seeing my messed up marriage. I'm seeing a bad situation that I'm in. I'm seeing this and I'm seeing that and everything's against me. I have a hard time, I have a hard time seeing that God has for me and God has a plan for me and a destiny for me. But God's destiny in your life is affected by some things. And I, we need to deal with that today. Why have you not stepped into your destiny? What are the things that have come along sometimes that seem to hijack that destiny from you? Well, number one is that I make bad choices. I make really bad choices in life sometimes. See, Jacob is reaping what he sowed. Jacob, all throughout his life, has made choices to be a deceiver and to be a liar. That's why his name was Jacob, the deceiver. He was a liar. He got his birthright through lying and deception. Where did his sons learn it from? Where did his sons learn to trick their brother and then lie about it? 
and deceive. Where do you think they learned that? They learned it from good old dad. He chose to be a dysfunctional husband. He chose to be a dysfunctional father. And those choices are not what God intended in his destiny. Sometimes people marry someone who they shouldn't have. Sometimes people disobey the will of the Lord. And the Bible says you will reap what you sow. And some of us are reaping really stupid things right now that we've done. That's the reality. You actually are not just an innocent victim of your circumstances. You created them. Choice by choice, each step of the way that you chose to take. And you will reap what you sow. See, our, we, we live in a culture that wants to blame everybody else. Oh, it's my mother. It's how I was raised. It was my dad. I didn't have a dad. He took off, and so I couldn't help myself. And, and I do these things because of these cir circumstances in my life and my bad environment. And I had this happen to me, and everybody should just feel sorry for me, and I don't ever have to be responsible for what I do. It's the teachers. They're all stupid. It's my dumb employer, my number 15th employer that I've had that I can't get along with still, but it's always them. It's never me. It's always somebody else's fault. Somebody else did this. But when will we start taking personal responsibility for ourselves? When will we start saying, you know, listen, my mom's been dead now for 10 years. Why am I blaming her? Dad's been gone for some time now. And I'm not a child anymore. And nobody can make me do these things. No, this didn't happen by chance. But you're reaping what you sowed. Galatians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9 says, For each will, each will have to bear his own load. Your parents don't bear your load for you anymore. You bear your own load. Let the one who's taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from, from, the, will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season, we will reap if you do not give up. You have to bear your own load. You have to take responsibility for your actions today. Mom and dad did not make you smoke pot. Mom and dad are not making you live in sin. Mom and dad are not making you disrespectful to your boss. That's on you and on you alone. And you will reap what you sow. If you sow to your flesh, if you just do what you want to do, and just, I do this because it feels good, I'm going to go after this relationship because it makes me feel so good, Re irregardless of what the Word of God is warning you about, irregardless of what you hear preached from this pulpit, when you go and do those things, you will reap what you sow, and you're, the blame is on you. You have to bear your own burden. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you're not an innocent victim. Don't blatantly disobey God and be shocked when your family is falling apart. Do not blatantly disobey God and, and walk in disobedience and be shocked that things don't bless you. That you're not fulfilling your destiny. Listen, as long as you walk in disobedience, you will fulfill your destiny of disobedience. That is the destiny you are going to fulfill. If you walk in disobedience to the word of God, if you walk in disobedience to God, you will fill, fulfill that destiny of disobedience, and it won't be a good one. And sorry to say, but the destiny of disobedience, according to Romans chapter 6, 23, the wages of sin is what? Death. And sin is disobedience to God. So if you want to stop reaping bad things, you have to start sowing obedience. You have to start acknowledging where it is that you went wrong. Where have you, where have you gone wrong and you make it right? No excuses. 
No more, I'm a pot smoker because God, my mother did this to me. I'm a drunk because somebody did this to me. No, you take responsibility for yourself and say, I choose today what I'm going to do with my life, and I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sow differently. I'm going to begin sowing obedience into my life. If you want to stop reaping bad things, you have to start sowing obedience. You can't get out of debt if you're not going to obey God and tithe. You can't get out of bad relationships if you're going to pursue relationships that are not godly and in ungodly ways. You will reap what you sow. You can't change your health. You, can't, you can just cry all you want about how bad your health is and, and because you have bad DNA. Too bad. Deal with it. Jesus has given you a new DNA. You have the blood of Jesus in you. So decide right now that I'm not going to eat those donuts. You can't sit there and eat the donuts and then complain that you got diabetes. You cannot be puffing on your cigarettes and then complain that your lungs aren't working right and that you have all these problems and now you have hardened arteries and you got high blood pressure and high cholesterol and all these things. Take responsibility. Stop reaping it. You've got to reap differently. Then you're going to sow differently. You won't produce successful children if you're going to disobey God and not discipline them and not train them up in the way they should go. You don't even have them in church. You're not even attending church on a regular basis. You once in a while pop into church and you wonder why there's no consistency or pattern in your life and in your relationships. God has not been the center of your life. You're going to reap what you sow. You have to reap differently. So take responsibility for yourself. Change your choice. Choose this day. Do it differently. Reap something different by sowing something different. And so one of, the, one of the, the conflicts of the destiny of God is your choices. You've got to surrender your life to the Lord. You've got to follow the destiny of God. God has that plan. It's your responsibility to say, God, what is that plan and how do I walk according to your will and purpose for my life? You've got to stop saying, I don't care what God thinks. Well, that's not going to go well for you. I don't even have to be a prophet to tell you that. I don't need to be nice to my husband. He's not nice to me. Well, that's not going to go well for you because that's contrary to the word of God. I don't need to be nice to my wife. If you just knew what kind of a horrible person she was. I had two women one time and one said, I'm married to, I'm married to the wife of the devil. The guy says, I'm married to the wife of the devil. And the other one said, that's okay, I'm married to the devil herself. That's not going to go well for you. You got to reap differently. You got to sow differently. So our choices, I make bad choices. And secondly, other people make bad choices in my life. Some of the things that are against you that seem like they're against you is because other people have met, done things in your life. And often Satan will work through people. It wasn't my choice for my dad to leave when I was four years old. People are free moral agents. I never put a beer in my mother's hand or my dad's hand. I didn't choose for them to be drunks. That's what they did. I didn't ask for what family I was going to be born into. And neither did you. You were dished some things. Some, some things were dealt to you that you had no control over because people are free moral, moral agents. And let me just give you a truth that you, if you will grasp this truth, it will help you in life so much. Are you ready? I need you to get out a pen and paper. You're going to want to write this down. This is really, really important to you. You're going to need this because if you will get a hold of this, if you will memorize this and accept this as a reality, it'll keep you from walking away from God. It'll keep you from walking away from the truth. Okay, ready? Here it is. Ready? People are stupid. <laughs> memorize it. Just know that. That's how it works. They do really dumb things. They do really, really, really dumb things. Churches do dumb things. Pastors are sometimes idiots. We're not infallible. But remember, you do dumb things too sometimes. And these dumb things can affect us. My dad's drinking and my mother's drinking had a major impact on my life. 
not being raised by a father, not having a, a man in my life, not having any male influences that were positive and, and not harmful in my life had a profound effect on me that still affects me to this very day. There is a deep gap and a deep hole in my soul that is still going to be there today. It is still there. It's something I'm still working through and still dealing with. But I've let God use it. And he knew my parents would do what they did, and he planned around it. Look, look what God did with some really stupid people in the Bible. Because you can sit here all you want and say, well, this isn't my fault. You don't understand how dumb my life has been. I, it's been terrible. I've had tragedy. People have, I was abused. I was molested. I was this. I was raped. I was all these horrible, horrible things happened in my life. And I didn't choose those things. So what, what, what could, what, what's going to happen now? But I want to listen. I'm going to give you some hope here today. There's some people in the Bible that did some really dumb things. Genesis 19, Lot's daughters got him drunk. And they slept with him. And they got pregnant by their father. That was really stupid. And the oldest daughter's son was named Moab. And he became the father of the Moabites. But if you look into the lineage of Jesus Christ, you find Ruth, who was a Moabite. And God redeemed that stupid thing that the family did. And so in Jacob's life, he had a favorite son named Joseph. Joseph had 10 stupid brothers who were filled with stupid jealousy and envy. And, and many churches are filled with that too. There are churches that are filled with jealousy and envy, and they do really, really dumb things. And these brothers threw him into the pit, sold him to slavery, where he was entrapped by Potiphar's wife, who wrongly accused him of raping her. Tell your neighbor, that was really stupid. Or you could say dumb if you think stupid's a bad word. All this political correctness, you know, I know. So, jo so Joseph is in prison, and his fellow cellmates betray, uh, betray his word to them, to betray their word to him. Say, people do dumb things. And those choices can lead us into hardships. But you and I can make a choice to trust the fact that God knew the stupid things that people would do and he planned around that. That he, he knew about the pastor who was going to hurt you. He knew about that church that was worldly. He knew about the dad who would leave you and the mom who would abandon you and the spouse who would betray you and abuse you. And you might be looking at all the negative stacked against you in your life, things that you have no control over, but nothing is going to derail the plans of God if you will walk in obedience to him. Nothing can. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 27. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out. Who will turn, from, turn it back? So if you're saying like Jacob, everything's against me. I want to remind you that God sees everything that is against you. And, 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 and everything that is coming against you. And he's taking everything that's coming against you. He's taking all your mistakes and all the mistakes of the people. And right now... He's up there going like this catcher's mitt, and he's catching it all, and he says, I'm going to cause all of this to be turned around for you, if you'll let me. Hey, batter, 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 batter. He's right there. He's ready to catch it. Your mistake, your parents' mistakes, your spouse's mistakes, no matter whose mistake it was, that person that cheated you, he's right there. He's going, I got this. You are the only one, you are the only one who can screw this up. You know why? Because you're the one who has the free choice. And if you will choose to elect this, if you will choose, no one has power to annul what God has purposed for your life. And you can now find out the third important thing about your destiny. God is the redeemer of bad choices. Are you ready to let God redeem those bad choices? Yours and everybody else's. You can say, it can't annul the plan of God for my life. Come on, say that. It can't annul the plan of God for my life.
Say this, I have a destiny. And there's nothing that can stop the destiny of God because he loves you. God is a redeemer of bad choices. What Jacob did not know and what he couldn't see, his son Joseph obviously was not killed. He's the governor of all of Egypt. And he ended up in the the place as the second command of the entire Egyptian empire. And in the end, this is how Joseph saw the stupid decisions of the people who made in his life. In Genesis chapter 45, what was really going on behind the scenes is what Jacob couldn't see. And there's things going on in your life right now behind the scenes, and you can't see these things. You cannot. You're like Jacob. You can only see what you see today. And you're saying, oh, everything's against me. There's no hope. Everything's bad. Everything's terrible. But at the same time, what's going on? So Joseph said to his brothers, verse 4, Genesis 45, verse 4, Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land for two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you, listen to me, God redeems it. God catch, caught that thing, he catches it. Here's, what, here's how it turns out. It was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all of his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. You know what this means? God planned around the stupid things that people do. God plans around your mistake. You might think that I'm just a kid, nobody wanted me. I was a mistake. I was born. I was, you may have been a, not planned by your parents, but you were planned by God. There are no mistakes. Maybe, yeah, maybe God's ultimate goal, obviously destiny, was that you would be born to a a loving family and a couple who were married. That's God's plan. It didn't work out that way. So what? You're still loved. You're still wanted. You were still planned. And God caught that thing, and he's, he's going to make it work out. He's going to plan around that thing. He plans around. He knew, he knew when he made you. He knew the past, present, future. He saw all of that together, and he planned for it. He's got this. And Jacob's thinking, everything is against me, when really it was all working for him. Everything was for him. Everything he thought was against him was actually for him. Imagine that. What if the things that you think are against you are actually going to be worked out for you? What if your your spouse that you're not getting along with, that you're fighting with, that you're going to get a divorce from today, what if that actually turns around to work for you? And God redeems it and restores it. What if those kids that are driving you crazy, that are on drugs and you're heartbroken over them and you can't sleep at night, what if it turns around and God's plan is it's going to work for you? And they're going to be preaching the gospel. Who knows? Who knows what God has planned? Who knows what God is doing right now behind the scenes? Romans 8, 28, we know That for those who love God, all things, say all things, work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's the word of God. That's the word of God. Now listen to me. I'm not perfect. I'm not a perfect pastor. I'm certainly not a perfect husband. I'm certainly not a perfect father. But I know the Lord, and I love Jesus. That's the only thing I can decide today. I love Jesus. With all my heart, I want to follow him. I want to walk with him. And I can have all kinds of anxiety today thinking of all the ways that I won't walk with him, maybe. What if I mess up? What if I blow it? Here's what I know, because I love him. He knows my heart. All things are going to work out. 
He's going to redeem me. He's going to redeem my mistakes. He's going to redeem my children. There's nights that my wife and I today, we still, just the other night, we were crying over something we did to our kids when they were two years old. They don't even remember it. We just thought, oh, we just handled that so terribly, honey. What are we going to do? We, it was just awful. And we said, you know what? God redeems it. That's what you do. I know I love the Lord, and so I know all things are going to work out for good. So listen, start loving Him and living according to His purpose. And then all in all things, God works for the good. How? <laughs> God in His catcher's mitt. He transformed it. He reformed it, and He went, back at you, devil. He caused it to work out. He causes it to be redeemed. He causes it to fit into his wonderful destiny for my life. God predestined us. And this means that God saw ahead of time all these factors, and he worked into, into his plan and into my destiny, and nothing can interfere with God's destiny if I will pursue it, if I will pursue him with all my heart. When if you want the destiny of God, stand to your feet right now and just say, God, I'm surrendering my whole life to you. God, I love you. This one thing I know, God, is I love you. I have no, I don't always have confidence, Lord, that I'm going to do the right thing 100% of the time. I know I'm not perfect. I know I make mistakes. I've made a lot of them, Lord. And they're under the blood of Jesus. So listen, first and foremost, right now, as I've been speaking about mistakes, choices, the enemy wants to come at you with condemnation and guilt right now. I know it. He wants to come and get you and condemn you. And right now, you need to stop that and you need to say, I receive forgiveness of Jesus. It is under the blood. So, Lord, I thank you that you've forgiven me. For the dumb things I do and say and have done, choices I have made, my weaknesses, my flesh is sometimes so weak. God, I receive right now, I forgive myself of those things because you've forgiven me. And I come into agreement with your word that I'm forgiven. I'm going to walk in that forgiveness. And now, Lord, help me to walk according to your purpose right now. Lord, show me anything I'm doing in my life that's not lining up with your will. Relationships that I need to get rid of. Circumstances I need to change. It doesn't matter that if I'm excusing it because so-and-so does it and all these people are doing it and everybody around me gets away with it, so why can't I do it? Everybody does these things. No, Lord, no more. That's, a, that's bad choices. And I will reap what I sow. I will bear my own burden. I'm not going to look to the person on my left or my right and justify anything. But this is my burden. That Lord, if I'm walking in a way that is in disobedience to you right now today, I choose life. Come on, do it in your heart right now. Choose right now. Choose life. Turn away from whatever God shows you right now. You say, Lord, I turn away from this right now. I repent. I turn away from this. I will not do that anymore. How I'm speaking, what I'm viewing, what I let my eyes see, where I let my heart wander, God, no more. I say no today to that and yes to Jesus. And Lord, today I declare, I love you with all my heart, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Come on, if you love the Lord, lift your hands and tell him you love the Lord. Just take a moment, just love on the Lord. Lord, I love you. Your life to me. Where would I be without you, Jesus? If you didn't rescue me, God, where would I be right now without you? What would my life turned out like without Jesus? Oh, God, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And Lord, because I love you, your word tells me that all things are going to be worked out for good. So Lord, I believe that you're my redeemer. You are my redeemer. And you'll redeem everything, Lord, from the pit. 
You'll restore the years that the locusts have devoured. Thank you, Lord. And I receive that promise right now. I receive restoration into my life right now. Lord, redeem my family. Redeem my children. Redeem my destiny. Redeem my future, God. Redeem me, Lord. Save me from the pit, oh God. Right now, I call on you, Jesus. I call on you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And now just know, just know, he's working everything out for good. He's turning it around. Redemption isn't always easy. It takes time. Obedience is a lot easier. If I would have been born in a Christian home, raised in a Christian, it would have been a lot easier. But that's not how it was. So I'm on redemption path. It's a little harder, but I'm still going to get there. And let me just tell you something. When you get there, you'll be where you were supposed to be in the first place. Not a day, God, not a, nothing missing. So if God has called you to be a, a, a gospel preacher, but you've screwed up your life so badly and you're just, you've been a wreck. You're on the path of redemption. Guess what? You're going to end up right where you were supposed to be as a gospel preacher. You'll still be there. You say, I think I married the wrong person. Oh, well, God will redeem it. He knew that. Let him redeem it. If you'll say, God, I will follow you with all my heart. Redeem this. That is going to be the spouse you're meant to have. You say, well, I was supposed to have this really godly woman who was a prayer warrior. Then you stay on your path. You love that woman you married who doesn't even believe in Jesus because you married her. You made that commitment. And God knew all that. Let him work it out. Let him turn it for the good. Don't you leave here today and say, well, I guess I could she'll go get a divorce. No, you don't. That is against the word of God. You're going to follow in obedience to the word of the Lord. You're going to say, I'm going to love this woman. I'm going to love on her. I'm going to love her, love her, love her. And God, guess what? He's going to redeem that. He's going to turn her into that prayer wife you thought you should have had in the first place. But you stay on that path. Harder. That's okay. It's even worse if you disobey now. And now you go get divorced. You're going to be even worse off. Don't do it. Don't take the devil's crossless life. It's not worth it. It ends up being bad. It's a bad deal. He's going to sell you oceanfront property in Arizona. It is not worth it. Don't you listen to that. Amen? Altar team, can you come on up? And we want to open the altar now for, for prayer. We will pray with you. We will believe with you. You come up here with your spouse and you get prayed over in your marriage. And we'll pray for your kids. What needs to be redeemed? We'll stand with you this morning and we're going to declare redemption over everything that God is doing in your life. Everything the enemy is meant for evil, God's going to turn that thing around for glorious good and glorious purposes. And we want to believe with you for that. And anything else you need prayer for, come on up, receive prayer. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Stop by in the foyer if you'd like to talk with my wife and I.